Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to How Do You Future Proof IoT? You add a hub. In this session, I'm going to give you a brief presentation over the future of the Smart Home Hub, an introduction into the new Works as a Smart Things Hub program, and then round out a session with a wash panel starring our partners Calix and Silicon Labs. My name is Albert Carr. I'm the director of manufacturing here at Smart Things. Uh, I've been with the company about four and a half years, primarily dealing with uh, hardware and supply chain, but I uh, currently lead product management for all things hub. <laughs> uh, I've been out in the professional world about 20 years, where I've spent the majority of my time working for Procter & Gamble, Leonardo DRS, and Samsung. Uh, I was told I had to talk about my hobbies, but I'm married with four kids, so uh, don't have any hobbies, or at least my family is my hobby. Uh, but uh, when I do have some time to myself, uh, I'm an avid University of South Florida fan. Go Bulls! And at some point in the future, I'd like to get back to restoring an old Porsche or two. But back to hubs. So early this year, around CES, many of the IoT-centered media outlets were announcing the death of the smart home hub. How they'd ultimately fade out. How Amazon and Google were killing it, and that was a good thing how even the most faithful Zigbee and Z-Wave partners were jumping ship to Wi-Fi. In short, the smart home hub was dying a slow and painful death. So let's take a look at this CES smart home and figure out why they were so quick to abandon the hub. Back in early 2019, the average smart home contained about 10 devices, and every manufacturer had their own app and their own cloud. If you were like I was, you had an entire screen on your smartphone full of these apps. And because all of this wizard gadgetry is novel, people were thrilled that they could voice control these devices, leading to a phenomenon I like to call couch control. What's couch control, you ask? Hey, Google, go do something for me so I don't have to get off the couch. So if you want that type of smart home, that's fine. Wait for your next uh, prime day, pick yourself up a $15 dot, handful of Wi-Fi sensors, you've got yourself a smart home. But let's talk about the future of IoT and why I say couch control just isn't going to cut it for very much longer. In fact, those 10 devices in these few short months, that's jumped to 16. In fact, by 2025, the average smart home is going to have over 100 devices. That's 34 billion smart home devices in the U.S. alone. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, users are not going to be happy just with voice control anymore. The goal of IoT is to simplify your life and give you some peace of mind. Having to say, Alexa, tell X to turn off my hall light. And Alexa, tell Y to turn off my kitchen light. And Alexa, tell Z to lock my door. It's just not going to work with 100 devices. Having to make users memorize the brand of light bulb they have in each fixture is also just kind of silly. In 2025, your home will be smart enough to run itself without much help at all. Most of these functions are going to be automated. Let me give you an example. On a cold winter day, you leave your house, a pipe freezes and bursts. Your leak sensor goes off, and it automatically shuts off your water valve. It then immediately notifies you and your plumber about the incident. At that point, your plumber gets a one-time use code that lets them into your house to fix the pipe all without you having to leave work. Except this isn't the future of IoT. As a partner with SmartThings, you can create something like this on our platform today. So then what are the real and perceived cons to a hub? Why does everybody seem to want them to go away? Well, simply put, many people think it's just one more electronic device in my house. And if it's just a gateway for Zigbee and Z-Wave devices, and everything's going Wi-Fi anyway, why do I even need one? Well, at SmartThings, we know that the hub will be crucial to the future of IoT. In fact, by 2020, we will be pumping more development dollars into the hub than we have at any point in company history. Here's why. First, we want to be the premier <clears throat> IoT platform. We no longer want you to have to have these pages and pages of IoT apps. We also don't want you to simply just control devices. We want you to be able to automate these devices and automate them whenever you want and however you want with a full featured rules engine that's also simple and intuitive. We also want you to have your users to have the biggest selection of devices available. This includes the thousands of devices on traditionally based protocols like Zigbee and Z-Wave. 
Like it or not, these are still the gold standard for low power and battery operated IoT devices. Wi-Fi is just still too power hungry. And lastly, we want to have as many device controls and automations as possible running on the in-home hardware, running on the SmartThings hub. Since 2015, SmartThings has worked hard to bring many of these device controls and automations locally, like our smart lighting automations. This year, we also added local control for the Philips Hue Bridge and the Sonos speakers. We will also be investing heavily next year to bring even more popular devices and automations local. So why are we pushing local so hard? Well, local automation and device control take the long path between the devices and clouds out of the equation. Some cloud actuated devices can take upwards to five seconds to respond. If it takes five seconds for your motion sensor to turn on your night light when you're walking through a dark room, it kind of defeats the purpose. It also improves security and privacy. When dealing with some of these inexpensive cloud devices, security may not always be the best. And you may not even know the name of the company who's actually receiving and housing your data. With SmartThings, the hub executes locally, and the data that does go to the cloud is aggregated and encrypted to make sure it's secure. Last point here is the kicker, and I cannot stress it enough. By 2025, IoT will not be a novelty. People will not just throw up their hands and say, oh well, if they can't control the devices during an internet outage. Users will be reliant on their smart home. There's even some futurists saying that switches may be obsolete in the next 10 years. Smart things will ensure that your local devices will be able to be controlled and your automations run even if your internet service is down. This reliability will be critical in the coming years. So that's why the smart home hub is important to the future of IoT. Now let's talk about how we're doubling down on the hub. Again, in 2020, we'll be investing in more local automations, more local integrations, and investing in new and innovative ways to get more smart things hubs into users' homes. One of these major 2020 initiatives is the WASH program. WASH stands for Works as a Smart Things Hub, and the program helps our device and service partners increase the scale and speed of the adoption of the smart home. In a nutshell, the WASH pro program marries your device and the Smart Things platform so that it becomes the local brain of the smart home, the Smart Things Hub. Currently, we have three active WASH products that are available now or will be in the coming months. This includes the Calyx Gigaspire Max Gateway here in the US, the NVIDIA Shield Gaming Platform, and the Vodafone Vox 3.0 Gateway in Europe. Stay tuned for more WASH partner announcements in the coming months as well. So how does the WASH program benefit you, the IoT developer and service provider? Well, first, we make it extremely easy for you to leverage our open ecosystem and the device and automation support that we're growing every single day. You're not just connecting smart home devices. You can leverage our platform to create novel recurring revenue opportunities as well. For service providers like ISP, you can create stickiness in your product that can significantly reduce churn. And because your smart home experience is powered by Samsung and smart things, you know you will always be on the bleeding edge of home automation. So, what types of devices make great smart things hubs? There's definitely some devices that are better than others. First, we want devices where the processors are always on and that we have a persistent connection to the internet. It's also great if the device is centrally located in the home. It's not really a hard requirement, but it does make networks more robust and less reliant on mesh repeaters. Devices already in the home are tied to required services like ISP gateways, routers, TV boxes, AV gear, Gaming consoles and appliances are all great candidates. And lastly, you need to meet the technical requirements, which we'll discuss in just a little bit. So there's two main ways to integrate with SmartThings. The fully embedded method has a hardware integrator laying in all the required hardware inside the box. A great example of this is the Galaxy Gigaspire Max. <clears throat> The pros on this, again, it's just a nicer looking product usually. It's easier for the customer and it has the lowest total bomb cost. It's a great way to integrate with WASH if you're developing a new device. If you have an existing compatible device, the partially embedded method is the way to go. This integration utilizes the SmartThings Link dongle to provide IoT radio functionality. System cost is a little bit higher with the dongle, but it's still significantly cheaper than buying a standalone hub. 
With the link dongle, we also handle the heavy lifting when it comes to securing the connection to the SmartThings cloud. So here are the major technical requirements need to make, make, need to, uh, to make your device wash capable. You'll need a compatible ARM processor with 64 megabytes of free flash and RAM running on a Linux or a BSD-based uh, OS and a compatible C library. You'll also need to S implement an SDP like Docker or LXC so we can update our binaries independent of your firmware. For Zigbee and Z-Wave radios, it all depends on your implementation strategy. If you're going fully embedded, Silicon Labs can set you up with the right hardware and expertise to get you out of the gate. If you're going par partially embedded, we set you up with the SmartThings Link dongle, which does require a USB 2.0 connection or above. For security, you'll need to implement a trust zone or uh, lay down a secure element in your device if you're going embedded. If you choose the partially embedded route, we take care of most of the security requirements for you in the dongle. If you're a service provider, it's even easier. Just contact us or one of our WASH partners to help you get the hardware and services you need to join the SmartThings ecosystem. You can call Calyx for a full suite of ISP enabling services, including SmartThings. If you're looking for enterprise gateway hardware, we also work with three of the biggest names around with Eris, Circom, and Technicolor. Ruckus can outfit you with SmartThings combined with the latest inter and enterprise managed level Wi-Fi. And if you're looking to create your own device, Silicon Labs is a one-stop shop solution for all your integration needs. When you're ready to join the SmartThings WASH program, the integra integration can be completed in four easy steps. The first step is simply the learning phase. Here, you learn about us, we learn about you, and together we can determine if your, pro your product is ready for the WASH program. The second step is where we give you our WASH toolkit and walk you through the process of creating your SmartThings hub. The third step is for you to test your product using our test guidelines, complete your required regulatory and industry certifications, and have our third-party test lab certify your device as a WASH product. The fourth step is to launch your product with the support of SmartThings and take your place as the brain of your customer's smart home. For more information on the WASH uh, program, please visit us at smartthings.developer.samsung.com slash washpartner. That's it for my presentation on the uh, SmartThings Hub and WASH. I'd like to uh, now introduce Alan DeChico, Senior Director of Solution Marketing at Calyx, and Chris Entz, Director of Business Development at Silicon Labs. Calyx has been one of our uh, lead WASH partners, and Silicon Labs has been our radio and integration partner for both first party and WASH products for uh, <coughs> oh, seven years or so. <clears throat> Thank you. So good afternoon, gentlemen. And good afternoon. Thank you for a well, great introduction. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get uh, started. Alan, uh, can you tell us about Calyx and uh, some of your products? Uh, it, uh, uh, I will. Uh, so Calyx is, uh, we, we develop cloud and software platforms. Uh, they're really part of the systems that deliver broadband service. You know, you can, you can simplify it that way. Uh, so our customers are global tier one service providers like Verizon, uh, regional, very local, Sierra, you know, thing, uh, companies like Sierra Telephone up uh, near, near Lake Tahoe. You know, so some of our service provider customers have as few as 1,000 actual customers, uh, subscribers. Um, and uh, we also support uh, cable operators, uh, municipalities, an increasing number of electric co-ops. So we really range, uh, you know, very broadly across what is considered a, a communication service provider. We have about 1,500 customers. And our space kind of, as you got the idea, we have networking solutions for a traditional access connecting, you know, central offices or head ends to the side of the home. But more and more importantly is the network inside the home. Uh, with, a, with a mission to really connect everything up, make sure it's e easy, seamless, and uh, setting the, the stage for enabling new services for, for, on behalf of the service provider. All right, thank you. Hey, Chris, why don't you tell us about uh, Silicon Labs and what you do? Thanks, Albert. Uh, my name is Chris Ince from Silicon Labs. I'm part of the business development team. Um, we, uh, we are the providers of the engine that goes inside of the devices and the gateways. Uh, we currently are the proprietors of 
virtually all the protocols available to the connected home, which includes Z-Wave, Zigbee, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, proprietary, and open thread. So our perspective has evolved over time because we no longer have the bias of one particular protocol, but we have the luxury of everything. So we really understand the advantages, disadvantages, what have you. And uh, over time, we're going to see the walls of those protocols start to evolve. Uh, we currently have approximately 3,000 uh, Z-Wave devices certified, uh, clients with devices. We have, uh, on the Z-Wave side, on the Zigbee side, we have approximately 2,500 uh, certified devices uh, using our, our radios, our products. So it's a, a pretty formidable ecosystem. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, Alan, uh, what's the value of smart things to you and your customers? Uh, we, you know, the value to us and really our mission in this, this whole endeavor is about the ecosystem. And uh, if we look at even who's on the, on the stage right now and who's not, it starts with the consumer, the service provider, the, the communication service provider, Calyx as a provider of solutions to the service provider, and Samsung even one step further back. And so we have this somewhat complicated ecosystem that's coming together through the, through the power of this partnership because no one of those players can deliver the solution that the consumer wants. Um, and we can talk more about some of the benefits of WASH uh, in a minute. But we really value the fact that we can rely on the smart things brand and promise of interoperability so that we can uh, deliver that to the service provider. They can rely on that interoperability. They can, they can look at the tool set we provide for managing it on the back end. And everybody has a trust level that's, that's fairly tight and established because of our relationships in three different directions delivering to the, to the end consumer. Yeah. Yep. So Chris, I'm going to kind of ask you the same question, but turn it a little bit. But you know, what do you see as the value of smart things? How does it help Silicon Labs and, and the way you guys uh, do your business? So we've been uh, partners with smart things for over seven years. And uh, smart things is both a client of ours in the sense that they build our products into their solutions, but we're also partners in trying to further the cause of the connected home. So uh, we view you folks and your customers like Calix, the integrators of the WASH solution, uh, as partners and clients furthering this cause. Um, it, it, it's a matter of, uh, again, that, that, that partnership of how do we leverage these technologies as solutions, not just capabilities to do for the sake of doing, but actual applications. Mm -hmm. um, we view what SmartThings has brought to bear as a, uh, a sort of clearinghouse of all the mystery of these protocols. There's so many protocols out there, customers struggle with which is the right protocol, what should I use for which application, how do I connect them all together? And you folks have proven a platform that can accommodate solutions in the home regardless of protocol. Great, great. So, uh, Alan, are there any problems that SmartThings WASH program help you solve? Uh -huh. I, I, yes, and, and it's almost a comedy of errors story. Um, if you go back to my customer is a broadband service provider. They deliver service to everyone who orders the service. It's not the tech savvy, uh, you know, engineers, it's not millennials and Generation Zs who've grown up with internet all their life. It's literally everyone who wants an internet connection. And so you have an, an entire, you have the entire, you know, bell curve of capabilities when it comes to, to understanding. So if there's a way that something can go wrong, it, it happens every day. It's right. statistically guaranteed to happen every day. And so we have customers who will take a, a home gateway and connect it in backwards. They are becoming a DHCP server toward the network, uh, issuing IP addresses you know, toward the, the internet. And so we, we, we protect the service providers from that, we clamp it down. And so now take what is a now fairly constrained environment of delivering broadband, getting into the home, having managed Wi-Fi, and turn it up a couple of orders of magnitude as you get into 
uh, smart home and, and uh, connected devices. Uh, so you know, your stat about have, you know, an average home having 100 you know, smart devices, that is 100 times infinity, the number of ways things will go wrong. Absolutely. So our goal here is to reduce error points, numbers of cables that can be connected in the wrong way, provisioning that can go the wrong way. Everything went wrong, but still something is, you know, that device battery is dead. And all those problems will flow back up to the managed service provider in a way that's overwhelming to them. So as we integrate a standalone hub into, as software into our software platform, we are cutting off a large collection of things that can go wrong. Yeah. We, we not only are becoming that simple interface for the subscriber, but we're now providing a tool set for the service provider to be that trusted advisor to help them out, right? My mother's gonna call and say, I just can't get you know, that light bulb in the back bedroom to work. She knows that her service provider is the person to call, and we're trying to give tools and so uh, to that service provider. So it all flows back from having a partner, integrating your platform into our local platform, and then providing that tool set to the service provider to make it all, make all the problems go, as many problems as possible <laughs> go away. So Because still, truck rolls are expensive. Oh, yes. yes. Because, <laughs> yes. And a lot of times they are simple things like, oh, this cable's, a, you, know, you know, spin it around. So I'm going I'm to stick with you, Alan, here. Uh, so you've heard my take on hubs. Mm -hmm. here. So how do you feel about hubs and their future in the IoT space? Uh, well, I have a, you know, as a, a fairly expansive definition of hub, in, perhaps, because I think of it as a processing and resource <clears throat> pool that's come into the home. Sure. I don't think of it as this white clamshell thing anymore. So the concept of a hub is strong and getting you know, more important every day. And you only have to look at the rest of communications infrastructure to look at applications moving further and further to the edge. You know, and while certain applications work great from a data center uh, that's you know, a half a country aside, we can look at pretty much every enterprise and an increasing number of consumer applications that need more processing, more local, disaster recovery, and, and concepts that have made sense for public sector or enterprise are becoming more and more important for the consumer as well, for the simple fact that somebody's ringing the doorbell, I need to know who it is even when something's, you know, the internet is down. It's it's almost a false argument to say, well, I'm, you know, you're worried about when the internet is down to your home because statistically it doesn't happen that, that often. But it's top of mind. Every consumer thinks and has lived through that experience. I live up in Sonoma County, right? I've been evacuated from my home. The internet's not working. You know, that's an unusual circumstance, but um, it, it, remarkably, it happens quite often. So having that local processing is really the extension of applications and the power of compute moving all the way out to the edge. Right. So when I integrate the SmartThings hub, the WASH hub, into a gigacenter system, I'm really <clears throat> just fulfilling that promise of local compute and resource. You raised some good examples. I'll, I'll keep answering the question. <laughs> Imagine as you have 100 or 200 or 500 connected devices on your home and property and you want to, you know, my wife is planting all kinds of native species in the yard, and we're worried about do they have the right amount of water and such. She can presumably reduce the complexity of all these sensors and draw back their, their processing to locally right there in the hub. Right. And so, but it could be health monitors, it could be lots of little things going on in the home that are simplified because there's local processing for them, real time, low latency processing. Right. Long-winded answer there, but the, the, the processing power of the local hub is cemented and, and going to go forward. Awesome, awesome. So, so Chris, I'm going to ask you kind of the same question. So, so what's your take on the hub and, and its future? We've seen uh, hubs evolve pretty significantly over time. Um, from our perspective, in the context of the 
the mesh network radio. Uh, the hub is the controller. We call that the controller. And then we have devices connected to that controller. <clears throat> and the controller can take on many different forms. So, uh, you know, it can be a traditional hockey puck sort of gateway. Uh, it can be a dongle. It can be built into the light switch. It can be built into the speaker. It can be built into all these different things. We're seeing more, uh, how shall we say, multi-purposing of that controller. So as opposed to having a dedicated single hub that all it does is be a hub and has a cost associated, you can now diffuse that cost by bundling that into another piece of equipment that would be part of the connected home, okay. like the light switch, like right. the speaker, or in the case of the service provider, the gateway. So this is a really valuable new trend for, I think, everybody in the, in the chain of the ecosystem, especially the consumer, because we can diffuse that cost to an extremely low number. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to have the gateway in the house anyways to do their Wi-Fi and to do their what have you. So now we can put that IoT <clears throat> radio into that gateway. It's a very small adder that gets diffused very quickly over time. So we're seeing some really creative things happening. Uh, it's exciting for us. We're seeing a lot of the service providers that we spoke about, the operators, the telcos, and the cable companies. Uh, they're very anxious to get involved in this space because they want to have a value proposition to the home. And they don't want to be the dumb pipe, right? They want to have a value proposition. So now they're looking at IoT as another service that they can provide to the consumer. So incorporating this sort of technology, these capabilities into their traditional CPE is becoming increasingly valuable. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Got it. So uh, Alan, so, you know, with your customers, what have, what have you heard about IoT and having a smart things offering? Oh, I, I think Chris pretty much used the words I would have said, is they are, um, they have, they are the trusted relationship with their, their customer base. And in many cases, they, they have subscribers who've been with them for 50 years. Uh, and, and they've evolved over time and added new services. Uh, you know, they, they added phone, they added video, you know, it was like you know, the, the, the service went up and yet increasingly um, they have their own financial pressures. They need to increase, you know, the number of services they provided. There's an unmet demand mm -hmm. from their subscribers. So, so there's this, this natural um, pull for the service providers to be able to move into that, to the IoT space and manage the IoT space. So, the feedback we've gotten is just phenomenal. Um, they already, the early adopters are putting together their own homegrown pieces and they're not always happy with the way it's working out. Uh, they're f discovering things that are unanticipated. So the power of the ecosystem that you've talked about is, is great. So we just came from our our big users group conference uh, last week, or in fact, earlier, it was this yesterday. Week, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday. It's all running together. Um, and the feedback was, was overwhelming, uh, you know, overwhelmingly positive. People excited about being able to offer a trusted IoT service. Great, great. So, uh, Chris, last question here. So, uh, what can we see uh, or we expect to see from Silicon Labs in the future as it relates to the uh, smart home hub? Uh, is everybody covered by NDA here? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to be a little careful. Um, in the sense that we have access to all these different protocols, um, we are constantly posed with the question, at what point do we converge these protocols onto single engines? Uh, so today we have solutions that combine, for example, Zigbee and Bluetooth uh, and Thread. Um, so moving forward, I think we're going to see more and more of the combination of protocols within a single engine. Uh, so, so what does that mean to uh, the consumer? Um, it's going to help break down the barrier of those protocols. Protocols could, should become less critical. Uh, you look at the confusion right now, you walk into Best Buy, and you look at the smart home, connected home segment on the shelf, and even an expert walking in, you walk away confused because there's so many different choices and so many things. And what if you get the wrong protocol? 
So again, I think that's really critical to figure out moving forward, how is that going to evolve? What's going to be important? Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the protocols will end up merging in some sense. It's going to take time. Uh, today, uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave are very prevalent in the, uh, the connected home space, in the consumer home space. So I think we're going to see that uh, continue for a period of time. At what point do they come together? Uh, we're, we're asked this quite often. So our researchers are trying to figure out how we do this, uh, how we do it at scale, how we do it so that uh, the functionality, the features are as not only as good as they are today, but even better. How can we improve range? Uh, range in the home is critical, point to point, but within the mesh also. So we're going to be improving range significantly. Um, we've discussed a little. We have a new Z-Wave radio uh, that's just become available that is doubling our range from controller to device. That's significant. So that takes us now from point to point in a small home, point to point in a much larger home. Um, the same device, we are reducing the battery consumption, uh, the, the, the power consumption, such that a battery powered device, uh, we estimate in a coin cell powered door window sensor, we will be able to get up to 10 year battery life. Mm -hmm. That's really significant in this space because uh, changing out the batteries, reliability, the sense of security, et cetera. So these are big incremental steps that we're going through. On the Zigbee side, we have a new chip called Series 2. Uh, similar advantages where we're getting more performance out of the chip. Uh, we're also raising the stakes in security and the hackability of the mesh network, uh, which is becoming critical. Uh, you know, we're con constantly faced with people trying to undermine these solutions. When we talk about professional monitoring, where security is critical, uh, we're trying to uh, incorporate mechanisms that really up the ante on the security and the robustness such that they cannot be broken into. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thank you both. Uh, that, that ends our session, but we would like to take some uh, questions from the audience, if we have any. Well, I can turn the tables on Albert and give him a question. Uh, you, can. <laughs> Very good. you mentioned the most powerful word up there in your presentation that went by in a heartbeat and is simply four letters uh, open. Correct. And, and so I think we haven't really talked about the value of the open platform nature of that maybe quite enough, and I'm happy to hear your, more of your comments or even the audience. That, that is almost the most critical thing for my customer base because they are service providers across the country, across the globe, and they want to be an open platform, an open ecosystem, and you know, particularly service providers live and die by standards-based implementations. Correct. And uh, and so that I can't even speak to the, to how critical that is, unless you're in the the service provider industry, uh, and maybe obviously down at the, the the radio wave radio level as well. So speak. To us again on on the open nature and and the power of the open platform sure, for us. Sure. So it's worth repeating. Yeah. So so at, at, at Samsung and Smart Things, we're we're absolutely like full speed ahead on open ecosystem. Uh, the closed wall garden just simply, I mean, it works. It's fine. You can you can do stuff like that. But as more and more devices come on, as more and more protocols come on, as as you know, in the future, the consumers choose the winners and the losers, the open platform becomes critical. You have to be able to get devices, more and more devices online, those new hero devices, those, those new devices that are gonna, gonna exponentially grow, you know, the open, they're the, uh, the home, and, uh, and really show what forward these, these different types of devices. It's, it's really, really critical to us to stay open, to stay on top, and stay, you know, future looking in that regard. And, and if you ask the consumer, what they want. It's very rare that the consumer is going to say, I want a closed system, right? A closed system can safeguard <clears throat> and protect a provider of a service because they have to do less, they have to support less, perhaps, which for them can be a good thing. But if you ask the consumer, would you prefer 
a closed or an open system, they're likely to say, I want access to everything. Right. Lots, want, of want, lots of choices yeah. or just a few? Yeah, right. I, I want all these things to work and I want them to work perfectly and well. So we, we tend to be believers in, op in open as well. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So, yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I want to know your future plans. So for example, you know, the fire just happening now and we find, you know, PG&E, you know, just, you know, shut down regions and not just one, but multiple expanded regions uh, of homes. And when they shut it down, you know, pretty much, you know, you can power, you know, all the connected devices. So you have any future plan that, you know, you can actually keep these devices running, uh, you know, for uh, extended home because you are forced to leave the area and you always, you know, want to think what happened to your homes, but the power utility companies shut down the power. Sure, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pitch this one Chris's way because, again, this is why, you know, we still believe very heavily in Zigbee and Z-Wave, right? These are low-power, battery-operated devices that can run even without power, uh, you know, and to, to make sure that you know what's going on inside of your house. And, and Chris, you want to kind of expound on some of those? Yeah, so first and foremost, generators are a good thing. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it never hurts to have a never generator. <laughs> uh, that said, w within the context of the, the mesh network radios, uh, we, we can operate in a battery operated mode for pretty extensive periods of time. And, and the architecture of the solution can be defined so that you have that uh, backup, so to speak, so things are still communicating and the mesh, the network is sustained even without power. And within the context of the gateway, a lot of gateways now, uh, they do have battery backup in themselves. Yeah, I can, I can talk right? to that. It's part of, you know, I can't power the house, but you know, coming from kind of a, a telco lineage, uh, we have been, struggling with and providing solutions for things like lifeline voice supports. Uh, you know, how do you provide the ability to have battery backup to make a phone call for eight or 12 hours or 24 hours? You know, going back to legacy black phone, pick it up, it works even when the power's out. Well, as we've moved to voice over IP, the, the consumer's expectation hasn't gone away. Now, it's, it's ebbing, and most people don't worry about making a phone call over their over their broadband service when it's down, they pick up their mobile phone. But the point you raise is, is so very true, and we talked about it while getting ready to come up here. There will be an evolution, perhaps driven by things like firestorms, where people start to think, okay, how do I guarantee enough of my smart devices are on a battery backup system, maybe, maybe a battery from Tesla or something that provides backup power for the critical functions in my home. I don't need every light to work, but there might be some additional um, you know, changes in, in home design or in device de design or in gateway designs so that, um, so that the battery is extended for a much longer period of time or it's able to isolate it uh, to, you know, um, you mentioned uh, power generators. Well, the problem is you get one or two extension cords coming out, though, and I'm like, well, which of the 500 things in my home am I going to plug into that, that one pigtail off the extension cord? So, I don't have a good answer for you, but I think there are a lot of people who have partial answers. Oh, I have another question. So I have visited a uh, smart home testing lab where, you know, there's over, you know, 200 uh, devices, and uh, I have seen, you know, you need to install, like, three or four very large hubs, uh, but you know, uh, what is your, what, uh, what are your future plans to actually make the hub can actually connect more device because you want to be the future brain of, you know, the smart home and, you know, putting all the device in one hub or one platform. And uh, so how do you actually, you know, uh, plan and design for the future? Sure, and a lot of this goes back to us, again, that open ecosystem of being on these standard platforms. A lot of the times when you're seeing these four, five, six hubs in a, in a smart area, it's usually because you've got brands that are these walled gardens. You've got these, these uh, devices where 
they're only going to talk to one specific hub. They're not going to talk to anything else, and, and that's just the way it's going to be. And, and so we, tr we also try to accommodate those as well to, to be able to do either a cloud-to-cloud -cloud integration or some sort of LAN integration with those partners to be able to do this. Um, but, but devices, again, that are open standard, ZigBee, Z-Wave, um, you know, we now say MQTT, some of these other types of, of protocols, we can speak to all of those devices. And, and again, you know, for, from our standpoint, right, we're willing to work with anyone. We're an open ecosystem. We're like Switzerland, right? We, we don't care who you are. We don't care if you're a competitor in a different space. We don't care, um, you know, if, if, if you're doing something off in left field. We're more than happy to integrate with you. Uh, you just, you know, you have to be willing to integrate with us. So, you know, some of these people that are making devices, again, if there's these, these standards that we can connect with, we're absolutely more than happy to connect with them. Um, but, but some people still want to have that walled garden. They want to have that curated experience. And, and so they're only going to connect to very specific things and do very specific things. Does, does that make sense? Yes, I have one wish list. Uh, uh, so... Um, we are looking into uh, all these, you know, uh, on-premise and uh, uh, on-device um, uh, solution where you don't need internet to mm -hmm. control uh, the device. Can you actually, you know, trying to do more and faster so that, you know, um, whatever, you know, product that I'm designed, I don't have to rely on the internet. I can actually just control using, you know, your hub, and your hub will become more powerful with backup battery, with you know, backup, you know, uh, data. That you know, once you know um, the power is up, is recovered, then you know, you just upload, you know, all the lost data, the log, you know, back to the cloud, and then you are back in business. You, you bet. I think you just described my business plan. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we, we are have a local platform that, you know, with its own compute and storage resources to be able to, right. to host the Wash Hub, Software Hub, but really any other applications that you really want to have critical function within the home or, or business with or without the internet up and supporting it. So um, that's why we have a platform that's related to their platform so that you know, we, we have a, a working ecosystem. And, and this is crucial to us, right? And we've, we've, been, we've had many, many things running local and automated local for, for about five years now. And, and next year, we're going to be exponentially increasing that. We're going to be working harder and harder and harder to get more devices controlled locally and more devices automated locally. So you can set up these automations, and they run even if the internet is down. There's another question. But yep, we've got we've got one more question. I think did you? And you another point I think to to with regards to the uh, the hub situation and so many devices that we want to connect to the hub. Um, and we talked about this earlier uh, when we were uh, planning this out. Uh, the the hub itself, the single smart things hub, can support hundreds of devices in and of itself. One hub. So that's a mixture of Z-Wave devices and Zigbee devices. So it's a big number in and of that hub itself. But we can also combine hubs. So we can have primary hub and secondary hubs. And we talked about this concept of what, what if the customer has something in the house already, they're using a solution, is there a way to now come in with this next solution and it takes control but can still use the devices from the original hub solution? And that's very possible. There are ways to go about that. So you can take advantage of multiple hub configurations. One becomes a primary, one becomes a secondary. You pick which is going to be the primary and which is the application that you like, which, again, SmartThings is, is very good at. Great. No. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, like, so I'm really excited about like the gateway and lowering the barrier of entry there for the hubs. Uh, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on doing the same thing for devices. Like in my home, I have like an Osram bulb that has one reset plan in a hue bulb that has a different reset plan, it just seems that there's still a large barrier of entry for making devices connecting to those hubs be a more seamless process, because that seems pretty important to get more market penetration for people who aren't really tech savvy. I don't know if that's a question for me or you, Albert, but I, I think that it is somewhat of a iterative cycle that's gonna go around in a circle as people realize that the human Human interface is the most important one that's, that's limiting the adoption of, of smart devices. So we can integrate software, but I can't 
change the human interface right. on a vendor by vendor. But I think that's the power of smart things sure. trying to sure. rationalize that. But but we, we, we have a, a little bit of a problem in that regard in the fact that, again, we're that open ecosystem, right? So we don't control everybody else's firmware on these devices, right? So they choose how you're gonna factory reset something. They choose how things are gonna work, how they're gonna be doing through. We're just integrating with them and trying to help them. I'm hoping in the future, you know, some of these standards like Zigbee and Zoogwave do a better job of, of trying to control that experience and try to actually line out how that works. Because I, I agree with you. It's, it's every time I have to do anything, you know, above and beyond, if I'm trying to bring a device in or something like that, I'm, I'm hunting down documents on what to do and, and how to reset. A lot of those are in the app. We try to, to control a lot of those, um, but, but some, you know, you, you have to go hunt for. So um, yeah. do you have any, any thoughts on that as far as how certification? Or, yeah, or we've identified that as a significant issue with regards to the connected home and the adoption rate and successes or failures that customers have. <clears throat> um, pairing and commissioning has been hard. Uh, do you press the button? Do you press it three times? Do you kick it? Do you press and hold it? Every device is different. It's so hard to figure out what's the right way. Um, so we're coming out with tools and mechanisms that help in the pairing process. So we came out with something uh, on the Z-Wave side that uh, Smart Things is in the process of uh, vetting out and hopefully incorporating that will help in that commissioning process. It'll make it easier for the consumer to very easily identify a device and connect it potentially before it even gets to the home, in a warehouse, on the truck, wherever it might be, in distribution. So when it gets to the home, you can plug it in and it just works, it's paired. So we're, uh, we're believers in the issue and we're trying to solve that issue with tools and I think you're gonna see some things sooner than later. All right, awesome. Yeah. Well, we've run out of time. I appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us in our session.